Hi, I'm Adam Doan. I'm a neurophysiologist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'm Rich Vogel. I'm a neurophysiologist from Nashville, Tennessee. My name's Anthony Sestokas. I'm a neurophysiologist from Nashville, Tennessee as well. And today we're going to be talking about classifying outcome data in the context of neuromonitoring data. So sometimes I think how we see our data and how that relates to clinical outcomes might be different than how surgeons see it. I've had that experience. I know we've seen that in the literature. So we can talk through about our perspective today and maybe shed some light about how we view things. So when we look at neuromonitoring data change in clinical outcomes, um, we don't always look at it in the context of the, the classic two by two contingency table. Uh, because one of the complexity, complexities of neuromonitoring data is when we report that something's changed, hopefully it correlates with something the surgeon's aware of and they do something with it. So there's an intervention, and that means that that treatment occurs before the reference standard, which is maybe a rarely an intraoperative wake-up test, most, most commonly a post-operative assessment takes place. So the treatment factor complicates how we view data. So I was hoping that today we could just talk through some different scenarios and about how we would classify those from a neuromonitoring perspective. So Tony, the, the first thing that comes to mind is something that I, I know I've seen a, a few times uh, personally, where a surgeon orders SSCPs and EMG for a cervical spine case, say an ACDF, and the patient wakes up with a C5 palsy. Uh, we did not detect it with our data. How do you view that? Is that a, a true positive, a, a false positive, um, like, or a false negative, I'm sorry? How do you view that from your perspective? Uh, I think that is a reflection of uh, inadequate understanding of uh, what monitoring means in the context of cervical spine surgery and uh, what various test modalities are available to assess uh, structures that are potentially at risk. In the example that uh, you used, uh, somatosensory evoked potentials are uh, uh, an excellent choice for monitoring spinal cord integrity, certainly uh, the sensory tracts in the spinal cord. But because that modality is not mediated by the C5 nerve root, uh, somatosensory evoked potentials are just not going to be able to detect any changes, functional changes in the C5 nerve root. So uh, it, that situation really reflects uh, in, inadequate monitoring and uh, can't, you really can't use the standard diagnostic criteria that you would uh, for in, in other clinical situations. So what would you have monitored that would have been more likely to catch something like that? Well, we know that the C5 uh, nerve root uh, uh, innervates uh, the ultimately uh, the deltoid muscle and, and uh, the biceps muscle. And so uh, any monitoring modality that is sensitive uh, to the activity of those muscles would potentially provide information about C5 nerve root function. Uh, many people have started to monitor uh, spontaneous electromyography from those particular muscles. But what the literature is showing is that the more sensitive modality would be motor evoked potentials that are recorded from, from those particular muscles. And that is certainly what, uh, what we would advocate uh, prior to surgery. So if we monitored motor evoked potentials, one of the most common ways that C5 policies unfold is through a delayed mechanism. So if you did monitor what we perceive to be the, the best modalities to catch that deficit, but in the patient wakes up fine and then goes on to develop a C5 palsy. Does that change how you would think about how we would classify that data from a, a true versus false perspective? Well, I would personally think about that in terms of the, the monitoring is a real time assessment of nervous system function. How is the, the structure that's being monitored functioning at that moment. And so as neuromonitoring is used during the course of surgery, it is assessing, in this case, C5 nerve root. And if there are no changes and the patient wakes up with no deficit, then that's a true negative. Now, if a deficit evolves over time postoperatively and you have a delayed deficit as you described, that's not really something that would be considered in that diagnostic quadrant that, that 
that, that you mentioned, um, because neural monitoring certainly in that way can't predict what will happen in the future. It can tell you what's happening in real time. Got it. So in both of these cases, one would be a, a true negative. And then the one that you're describing, if we watch SSCP's EMG and the patient wakes up with the C5 palsy, is that a, a true negative and just we didn't have the right monitoring plan? Well, from the point of view of the surgeon, uh, it would be a, a deficit that was not detected. So it would be a miss from the surgeon's perspective, right. looking at it globally from uh, uh, the in intraoperative neuromonitoring monitoring service that is, that is being provided. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, looking at it specifically from the tests that were available, uh, it's, it's a true negative because the modalities that were being used uh, uh, did not indicate any change in those nervous structures that those modalities were being monitored right. uh, by. Um, all right, now let's think about something like a, a deformity correction or you know, scoliosis surgery. One of the things that we see in the literature, and I, I know I, I've heard anecdotes of this, is when we monitor for cortical spinal tract integrity, a lot of times you'll see distal extremity muscles selected because they're very richly innervated, so hands and feet can be standard. But in that deformity procedure, Perhaps they do something like a, a PSO at L4, and maybe the L4 nerve root is the most at risk, which could predispose a, a, like a, a, some type of quad weakness. If you're monitoring hands and feet, so you are including motors this time, and that patient wakes with that L4 deficit, how would you classify that from a, a monitoring perspective? Well, in this particular case, the the structure that's at risk isn't really being adequately monitored. So I think, well, you have multiple structures at risk in this procedure, obviously, and you kind of have to break those down. Certainly the spinal cord is at risk, and that's being adequately monitored. I think hands and feet are a good assessment of spinal cord function. Um, they're, um, they don't give you a full analysis of, of what severity of a deficit may be if you do have a spinal cord issue. So there's a difference between losing your motors from your feet, for example, and losing them from the entire leg. Um, so, so having that assessment of the in, of, from, from proximal to distal is helpful. But in the case that you described, you have an L4 nerve root deficit that has occurred and with hands and feet monitoring, you're not assessing that nerve root. So, in, um, so from purely as, as Tony mentioned, from a what did we monitor perspective, it would actually be a true negative. But um, a full assessment using motor evoked potentials from say the quadricep muscle um, or the tibialis anterior muscle or both, will give you more information. And uh, certainly, if the patient would, were to wake, for example, the foot drop or quadriceps um, injury, that would be detected. And so in that case, you would expect, with that detection, it to be a true positive. So it's not just the right modalities, it's the right modalities applied to the right structures as well. Mm -hmm. So. What about if you are monitoring for, say, like a, a C5 corpectomy, and they put in the graft, and you lose you know, the left upper extremity, surgeon is informed, does something about it, maybe takes out the graft, checks things out, um, blood pressure's bumped up, data comes back. How would you classify that? Because I think that's where we get into a little bit of the, the treatment paradox. Well, if you're, if you're looking at that scenario, uh, from the point of view of uh, what the monitoring modalities were telling you at the end of surgery, which is just prior to when you are going to get a clinical exam, uh, with all of those signals back at baseline levels, uh, you would consider that from a purely diagnostic perspective uh, a, uh, a true negative. You would, you would not be predicting a deficit uh, even though there was a significant change during the course of surgery that subsequently resolved, by the end of surgery, full resolution would likely be associated with absence of a clinical deficit. Mm 
So a, a true negative. And along a similar line, deformity procedure, you lose the data, you can't really explain why, and you know you, you deploy dynamic spinal core mapping. So you do a laminotomy, you stimulate to get a, to the point where conduction is lost. You figure that out, you decompress at that area, data comes back in that procedure. Would you take that same approach where uh, that Dr. Sistokis took, where it was uh, in your mind classified as a uh, a true negative with reversed signal change? Absolutely, and this is something that Dr. Larry Lanky has described for years in the literature. Um, it, it, it's the same thing, you know, there's, there's the preservation of, of signals after some intervention has occurred in this case. It's um, some, some form of a decompression that releases that compression on the cord, signals come back, everything is fine at closure, it's really the status of the signals at closure that have to be associated with the patient's wake up exam. And in that case, if everything is back to baseline, patient has no deficits, it's a true negative. So it's a true negative, but in the context of that was most likely a real signal change intraoperatively. Mm -hmm. Correct. And you know, in the moment, the assumption would be that if you had that um, the ability to assess the patient's function and wake them up, that they would um, be exhibiting a deficit in that moment, in which case it would actually be a true positive. Right. But reversing the signal and bringing things back to baseline, having the patient wake up with no deficit, ultimately results in a true negative classification. And that's where that classic two by two table doesn't fit so neatly into the IONM world given the context of the intervention. Right. So and most most of the time you do not have a gold standard clinical exam in the middle of surgery correct. against which to measure the accuracy of your diagnostic tool. Right. Um, so Tony, probably the last question. Uh, one of the, the, you know, even though true negatives are pretty rare, true positives are what we experience more of. So if we have a procedure where we are monitoring the right structures, they do change in, during the procedure, surgeons inform, does or doesn't intervene, there's no meaningful resolution of that data and the patient wakes up without a deficit. How do you think about that? Well, when, if with the patient, uh, waking up with no deficit and that uh, test change uh, persisting through the end of surgery as, as indicative of, of a likely deficit, that, uh, that would be a false positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and that does occasionally occur. That's one of the things that we try to uh, minimize, but uh, as, as is the case with, uh, with most diagnostic tests, you, you do have some uh, false positives. Right. And yeah. we also know that the number one reason behind false positives is inappropriate anesthesia, particularly with motor evoked potentials. If you have any gas on board, your probability of having a false positive is orders of magnitude greater. Yep. And the data is what the data is, but your interpretation of the data maybe tempers the degree of what that false positive is taken into account. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you guys. I appreciate your time today. Thank Our you. Pleasure.